here is the sum and substance uh, of what I had picked up, and I already reported this to Bill Cass in, because Cass is making a pretty good study too. Good. And, uh, and that is that you know that about the Holocaust cases that I'm involved in? Yeah. The first one was the Swiss bank case. Now, what I'm about to say, or you interview or whatever, has nothing to do with the Swiss bank case because that was not a crime against humanity or a war crime or genocide, all of which are defined terms, very carefully defined. It does not mean bad acts. It doesn't mean terrible con job like the banks, Swiss banks did. It means war crimes, crimes against humanity, or genocide. And, uh, and that's what Jackson at that 1945, as part of that international tribunal, negotiations that set up the court? Yep. Isn't that what, that's the negotiation there, wasn't it? Yes, and that, and, and it was the conclusion of, it, they're called, it's called the Nuremberg Tribunal Records. Uh, and it, it happened at the very end of the Nuremberg Trials. Hmm. Nuremberg is our anglicized spelling, N-U-R-E-M. In German, there is no M. Uh, it's Nuremberg. Uh, but when you say that, people around here think you're wrong, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and if you were, were to ask me about those uh, things, it would be moving forward from the Swiss bank case. The next one we filed was slave labor, where we're suing for the survivors, and there are several, or descendants of women, uh, and, uh, that's in the Volkswagen case, prisoners of war that were forced into slave labor by the Nazis during the war. We now have sued, and I don't know how much you know about it, that case is settled here just a few weeks I didn't ago. I know that, no. It was settled for $5.2 and that money is paid. Wow. Uh, it's not been distributed, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, in an, it's in existence. And they still continue to receive the interest up until the time the final documents are done, which will be some time. But at least the money exists and it's segregated. Now, that was recovering for prisoners of war in Germany forced into slave labor by the Nazis. And all of those uh, Germanic peoples and the government were required to waive the statute. Now, since that time, there have been some other statutes passed, but the the fountainhead of it all was Robert Jackson and his number one trial assistant uh, at throughout the whole Nuremberg trials, which was a guy named Thomas F. Lambert. And uh, they insisted that the Germans waive the protection of all statutes of limitation, national, international, everything else, on certain classes of conduct, those three things. And, and but for that, but for Robert Jackson in 1945, right? Mm -hmm. Seeing ahead a half a century where other men could see only to next week, he, uh, he anticipated then uh, that there is an argument about whether it was Lambert or Jackson, but forget Lambert today. Uh, the, uh, they got that into those documents. And if it weren't for that, none of these cases that are now coming down, and the third one is, well, you read the Volkswagen yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, how's that for a daycare center? <laughs> you read it, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable, it's right. And, uh, and that Porsche that Dr. Porsche keep talking about is the same. We're damn Porsche. Yeah. Right, the same guy that builds the Porsche cars, you know. Uh, but in any event, uh, that one is also uh, by virtue of, in fact, in that complaint, there's even reference to the Nuremberg uh, trials. That's all Jackson. We couldn't do it without. And the idea was at the time that to carve out, the, the indictments were fairly, I don't say fairly specific, but they were specific as to nature. The, there were four types of indictments. 
Is those the definitions that were really part of the uh, carve out on the statute of limitations? Yes, that's where they came from. Mm -hmm. The difference between genocide and uh, crimes against humanity, for example, would be the difference between the types of indictments. Mm -hmm. And we call them indictments, but you know, we're not on right now, are we? No. No. On the, the no. film, yeah. Okay, between you and I, we call them indictments. Uh, but don't forget, this is the first court, this is the first statute, law, trial, and there's never been any since. Yeah. So it's a, you can't really refer to a body of law. I mean, Jackson made it up as he went along, and the one thing he did, which all these people today, and you know, 5.2 billion, every billion is a thousand million. That's right. Uh, and uh, the, uh, none of that would have been possible. In the Swiss bank case, we were able to get around a statute of limitation because of a doctrine known as equitable tolling, which yep. you probably studied in law school, uh, but you never studied 55 years worth. No. Uh, uh, and uh, all, the other name, it's the same, same uh, co legal concept, but it's sometimes called uh, fraudulent concealment of the expiration of a statute where the defendant who would otherwise be protected by the statute if they do affirmative acts uh, it's involved in every price fixing case mm -hmm. because otherwise you can only recover for three years even if they fixed for ten years but we the cases usually go back anywhere from eight to sometimes eighteen fifteen 20 uh, years, mm -hmm. uh, all because of the concept of equitable tolling. And we use the same concept to reach the, the Swiss banks in the uh, gold and deposit case, and it worked. And of course, I got to admit, this is the only type of case I've ever been involved in where the whole world's opinion and the, every judge's opinion and every human being's opinion is looking for a way to get you there. Yeah, and so obviously, if it was a bread and butter daily thing, I don't think anybody on earth could get back 55, 56 years. But we only had to do it once. That's terrific. Uh, how did you interface with Tom Lambert? How, how does it, Art Bailey? Oh, I've known Tom. Well, don't forget, uh, I went into the uh, what was then called American Trial Lawyers Association. Mm -hmm back in the early 60s. The first, I think I was out of school one year before I went to my first convention. Uh, and uh, I got to know certain of the greats that existed then. But every great lawyer I've ever known that is in what we now call ATLA, that's uh, the same acronym but a different name, it used to be called the American Trial Lawyers Association, and in about 66 or 67, uh, we got sued by the American College of Trial Lawyers on a name similarity, and the suit was in California where they have a special statute that is, if your name is even similar or it's even arguable that there can be confusion, uh, you win. And, the biggest honor I've ever known a lawyer to get. Both organizations selected the best trial lawyer that they knew in, in their membership or elsewhere in the country, and neither of us ever knew that we both went to the same guy first, Craig Spangenberg in Cleveland, uh, because he was both intellectual and, and a great trial lawyer. But that suit went on for years, and I was one of a three-man committee out of then 18,000 members uh, that I didn't do any of the litigation because I was like 26, mm -hmm. 27 at the time, something like that. <clears throat> and uh, But I was on, uh, on the American Trial Lawyers Association committee to handle what we called the college litigation because we called them the college. and. We, we called us the American Trial Lawyers. So we had to change our name. In a, in a way, we call it a settlement. We actually lost. But uh, 
we finally settled it by saying, okay, we'll change our name, but it has to be changed to Association of Trial Lawyers of America so that we can keep the ATLA, the yeah. ATLA. Yes, and most people that aren't close to the situation don't even know that that case ever existed because ATLA was before, ATLA was after, they must have won. Yep. We really got our ass kicked. But, uh, <laughs> the, uh, but in any event, uh, the first meeting I ever went to, Tom Lambert spoke at, and you've never heard him speak, have never you? Happened, no. I'm telling you right now, there is no other human that could speak like Tom Lambert did. And, and you can hear this if you just picked out of the past 35, 40 years of the best trial lawyers in the country uh, and the most active ones. Every single one to a man will say the same thing about Tom Lambert. First of all, he was a brilliant, brilliant lawyer. But he could speak in poetry. He wrote in poetry. He was very much like Cardozo, and, he, and that was one of his idols. Uh, and uh, but everything rhymed. Everything was, you know. Today you pay the politicians always pay uh, uh, advertising agencies and various consultants to give them just two little cute words. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd rather fight than switch and things like that. Uh, things that become legendary. You could talk to Tom Lambert or let him speak to a PTA. And, and just as natural, and by the way, I can do this pretty well. I, can, I have a way with words, painting word pictures. But uh, as Plato We keep most of your letters. Yeah. <laughs> as Plato said, the wisest man knows how little he knows. Mm -hmm. And I'm good enough at it to be one of the disciples of Tom Lambert. And. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, I've followed him ever since then. And he was, incidentally, if you're not aware of it, for a long time, he was the general director of the American Trial Lawyers Association. He ran it. And we paid him hellacious salaries, better than any law school could pay in those days. Later, he gets paid a half a million a year from Suffolk uh, and we went into a part-time uh, uh, basis with him, but uh, the, the truth is that that's how I got to know him. And everybody in the organization, uh, like for example, usually we have sections. You may have, oh, a thousand men in the uh, auditorium on torts, and maybe three or four hundred on uh, something else, and maybe five hundred on products liability. When Tom Lambert speaks, uh, everything else shuts down, and you all go to listen to Tom. Plenary session, right? Yeah, and uh, anyway, that was him, but uh, he's just another great man. But the, the guy behind it all was Jackson. And, and when you look at the list of lawyers on that, that, that pleading doesn't have many. That's only got a few. Mm -hmm. But the, the slave labor case, Christ, we got... Uh, that's the biggest problem we got in the case. Every single big law firm, especially the ones with Jewish members, they want if they don't care if the only work they do is what we call liaison work, making sure everybody gets a copy of uh, everything else. They don't care how far down the echelon they are, as long as their name can be on it. Yeah. And and I got to tell you one other quick story before you start. Uh, Senator D'Amato was a head of the U.S. Uh, Senate Committee, which controlled all the documents that related to that Swiss bank case, because he was a, a chairman of the Senate Banking Committee. And we had to get his permission to take anything out of their archives or really to do hardly anything for a long time. I mean, as long as the son of a bitch was in Congress and aware of this case. Mm -hmm. He was a pain in the ass. And, and if he did this once, he did it 15 times. 
we would go to say we understand that Stuart Eisenstadt uh, has documents from this bank in Bern, a little small bank, uh, and we need to see those documents. We don't care if there's nothing there, but we have to be able to say there is nothing there. And how can we say there's nothing there if we never saw them? So we got to see them. Could we have access? We got all kinds of court orders saying we should have access. Yeah. Uh, but he say, you know, no problem. We can take care of this. Glad to take care of this. He said, but you know, it's a very intricate business moving in the Congress and the Senate committees and the council structure and all that. And you really should have. Uh, somebody who's had a lot of experience doing that and even if you don't have to pay him the committee will pay him you don't have to pay him but you have to work through them and so on okay okay what is it his brother no kidding his fucking brother he tried to stick his brother who's a, who's a bad actor to begin with uh, and a lousy ass lawyer a neighborhood lawyer in uh, uh, Garden City Long Island okay uh, he every step of the way and we'd go around him, yep. we'd go around him, and everybody else would be instant, you know, and just thank us for what we were doing. And the next thing you know, they'd call up and say, the chairman said, <laughs> you gotta go through him. When you go through him, you had to take his brother. His brother never did get on, and we finally did get the documents, but some better lawyers than I had a hell of a time working around it. But that's just an example because the Jewish vote was so important to him. He wanted to be, in fact, every time we had an announcement, we had to clear it with the Senate Banking Committee. Now, can you tell me why if CNN wants to interview, uh, uh, let's say, Mike Hausfeld or Stuart Eisenstadt or one of our people, Bert Newborn, uh, the, uh, why should we have to clear or why should CNN have to clear with the Senate Banking Committee. The only reason was he wanted to be there. Absolutely. Son of a bitch showed up. I'm telling you, uh, there's, there's a <laughs> phrase from the country that he's like horseshit. He's all over <laughs> wherever you go. I mean, that's a pretty old saying because it goes back to horse and buggy days. But that was Senator D'Amato. He would pop up like a bozo clown. You, you know those clowns you used <laughs> to buy for your kids? You know, you yeah. knock him over once and he bounces up again. But Anyway, uh, the, uh, that's just uh, typical. But anyway, whatever we can add. And you're going to put this in the archives for Jackson? Yep. Lambert, uh, do you ever talk about Jackson? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, keep in mind now, he's dead. I understand. Uh, and uh, that was one of his claims to fame. Mm -hmm. He was military uh, in attitude, in discipline, in fact, you know something? I think he was military when he was the head uh, JAG uh, lawyer with Jackson. Mm -hmm. I think he was in the military then. I, I, I'm embarrassed. I'm not sure of that. Uah, but in any event, uh, he, that was one of his claims to fame. I mean, all the rest of us worshipped him for other reasons. Mm -hmm. His ability to write, his ability to speak, his ability to create word pictures <coughs> that would make a room full of 1,500 men cry mm -hmm. just from the way he could create word pictures, all right? Uh, that's why we all admired Lambert. It had nothing to do with Nuremberg. Uh, and uh, to be honest with you, I never paid much attention to Jackson, and I just took it for granted when I came to town. Uh, and. Uh, I never made an effort to read all his opinions or to study about him or to know about him until it was so late in my life that I was ashamed that I had pissed away all that time when there were guys alive. Don't forget, when I came into the bar, uh, I used to talk with Ernest Cockcroft. You probably weren't around then, but you heard the name. Sure. Ernest Leet, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, Elton Erickson and Mike Lombardo. Mm -hmm. Christ, Mike was a contemporary, mm -hmm. okay? I had, ac Willard Cass Sr., mm -hmm. okay? I had access to all these people. And like so many other things with my life, 
uh, I dissipated it, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, I let it go up in smoke. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, you can, there's a lot of things in life if you lose, you can replace it. Like money to start with. Like assets. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you lose a fund of knowledge that's in the mind of a human being, uh, mister, you blew your birthright right there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, I like to pass it off and say, well, shit, what about the guys that were ahead of me? What about McKee? What about Goodell's? What about all these other guys? Well, fine. Uh, that may be true, but it doesn't salve my conscience anymore to say that somebody else committed the same sin more so. That don't remove mine, you know? That doesn't make me feel any less guilt. So in the last few years, and I must say, when I, when it hit, like I've been in a room, how's this for an experience? I've been in a room in the Jewish Embassy uh, in Washington when we're having a high-level meeting on this very slave labor case. And the name Jackson comes out uh, on this very Nuremberg point and everybody thinks he's from Jamestown. They never heard of Frewsburg. <laughs> and I'm, I'm willing to leave it that way. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, anyway, uh, the truth of the matter is uh, one of the German lawyers, bilingual lawyers, uh, Mr. Bailey, you from Jamestown, New York. That's the same Jamestown, New York, Justice Jackson was from, emphasizing it was a German lawyer that knew friggin' A well who Jackson was and where he was from. Uh, and, uh, and I'm like this. Yeah. And, and today when I walk in the room, you know, I'm from where Jackson came from. But it is absolutely true. If he hadn't of, uh, if he hadn't forced, caused, cajoled, or whatever he did to get that waiver into the Nuremberg Tribunal documents, none of this would be possible. And uh, so, however you want to get that out. Uh, I think you're getting it out. Yeah. <laughs> it's terrific. Did, um, as you go through this process and you're harking back to the Nuremberg, and, and even if as with this Tom Lambert, I understand you're going to be uh, one of the folks eulogizing. Right, yeah. Um, did he, did he ever, did he ever mention to anybody, of, of, so going back to the Nuremberg, harkening back to that, the actual process of the trial itself, whether he felt it was a justifiable trial, this is something, the issues of ex post facto, all of those things which are sort of brand new jurisprudence. Did he ever question himself or question the, the legitimacy of the trial? He never discussed that with me, but I am sure that uh, other people that would have discussed such things with him mm -hmm. very definitely he would have had an opinion on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would be unfair of me to try to say what his thoughts were, except generally I can say that he was always very proud uh, of being part of the team, especially the highest uh, uh, trial member of the team, uh, and that they all thought that they were doing God's work. Mm -hmm. I don't think there was any part of the delegation that uh, thought, and my own study of it uh, confirms that, that uh, they all thought that they were righteous plus a lot more. Did Tom take a piece of the prosecution? Did he mention that? Yes. Yeah. Do you know what piece he took? No, uh, but he handled much of the uh, cross-examination and he also prepared a lot of uh, Jackson's own questions, uh, but Jackson deviated a lot, according to Tom, especially when he would find a subject area that wasn't anticipated by the next checklist item. He'd be off following that for a length of time. Mm -hmm. And you've watched the video and the movies of the trials. So, yeah. mm -hmm. Uh, and you can see that, and uh, the, uh, but I, 
I can tell you right now that I was surprised when uh, I found out how critical the work that we're now doing uh, depended upon that that original yeah. writing of the tribunals, as they call them. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. And people around here uh, who, uh, you know, uh, drive into work and back each day, they're just oblivious to the fact that the great man lived here and what his greatness was. And I've, I've thought for many years that the, the Bar Association should sponsor an, uh, a lecture in Chautauqua Amphitheater once a year and make it the uh, Robert Jackson uh, series and it will go forever and the bar doesn't need an impetus. They don't have to make somebody famous. They just have to uh, stop overlooking the obvious. And uh, if you can imagine the kind of people that would turn down almost anything else, but they would show for that as far as speakers. There's nobody big enough. There's nobody smart enough. There's nobody uh, high enough that would not be honored to come handle that lecture. And we ought to have it published. There ought to be transcripts. And a hundred years from now, people should be able to look back at it, you know? Don't lose the thought, because this June, there's the centennial of the Bar Association.